Hello, I'm Jennifer Kemp. I'm head of partnerships at Crossref, and I'm very happy to have the chance to speak with you today about how Crossref metadata integrates with scholarly research tools and discovery systems. I'm going to do a quick overview um, uh, to talk a little bit about Crossref and then talk in some more detail about the importance of quality metadata and how it can be improved. Then I'll provide some resources for further help and support, and I'm very happy to take questions. Crossref is a membership organization. We're here to improve scholarly communications and to make research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. We have over 16,000 members around the world uh, and many affiliated organizations as well, including a lot of the users of the metadata. We now have just uh, about 135 million scholarly records. Publishers and funders both join Crossref as members to increase the vi visibility of their content and to aid discoverability. That's what we'll focus on today. But there are a number of other uh, services that they use and really the DOI is, is just the start of those. We preserve the metadata and make it available through a number of different open APIs and search, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it is very heavily used. We see around 600 million queries per month across all of these open APIs. And that's really why the metadata is so important because it is so heavily used. So publishers are our largest group of members. Um, many of them are not uh, publishers primarily. They do publishing, but as a secondary or tertiary activity. Um, and funders can join as well and register their grants. And members themselves are heavy users of this metadata. So it's not just um, non-members using the metadata, but really everybody benefits when there is more and better metadata in the system. And you can see there are a number of different kinds of organizations that join as members and use the metadata. This is just a, an example. So what kinds of content can be registered with Crossref? Um, if you have content uh, that you're working with and you're not sure if it can be registered or how to go about doing that, please just let us know. Journal articles still make up the bulk of the 135 million records that are registered. And these numbers have been largely stable over the past few years. Um, books are a very fast growing uh, content type, but it's actually at this point, it's uh, posted content or preprints that are the fastest growing type. That's the yellow sliver you see in the noon position there. Um, but but uh, peer review reports are growing very fast as well. So this will change a bit over time um, as new content types emerge. So what is the information that we're talking about including? Um, across Ref, we have our own schema. So the information that we collect and the format uh, that it comes in is a little bit different from something like MARC records. Uh, there's certainly some overlap. And what we uh, require is really fairly minimal. It's um, that basic metadata is largely citation information. So it's things like uh, titles and author names. But there is a lot of other information that can be included. So um, funding and license information, for example, are very frequently requested by users of the metadata. And you can see maybe at the bottom there, um, I put in a couple of other items that are very frequently asked for by these users. And that is, uh, those are abstracts, references, orchids, and affiliation information, not just for the corresponding author or the first and last author, but for all authors included. And again, this will uh, change a bit over time. There will be new content types emerging. There will be different um, elements that can be added to uh, Crossref metadata records. So I should note that records can be updated at any time. Updates don't incur a fee. Um, and records often are updated either to make a correction or to add in additional information. So things we've been working on recently include, I mentioned a peer review reports. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about linking to related records, grant identifiers that uh, funders deposit, um, and ROAR identifiers, the research organization registry. 
So there are a couple of different contexts or settings, uh, use cases for the metadata, and I'll try to touch on all of these a little bit, but we are sort of focused on discoverability here today. So um, if you're interested in, in getting a little bit more detail about these uh, particular contexts, we have a nice page that summarizes those. So what you see here is kind of an overview of those um, use cases for the metadata. So you see that on the outside of the wheel, and then on the inside of the wheel is um, what those um, organizations um, and services do with the metadata. So I won't go through this in any detail, but just to touch on a few things uh, quickly. Um, so libraries, of course, are probably an obvious use case for the metadata. There are over 3,000 of them of different kinds around the world uh, that use one of our services to pull records into their uh, discovery systems and link resolvers. So it's just an easy way of making the records deposited with Crossref uh, easily available to their users for discovery. And then hosting content is a function that is, of course, you know, really focused on uh, presenting the content, whether it's journals or books or whatever the case may be. But these platforms are really important to us because they are also responsible for highlighting a lot of the metadata. So they do things like make sure that the DOI is expressed as a clickable link and not just text on the page, for example. Uh, and they may use the metadata to pull together related items to make recommendations for um, related content to point the reader to. And the important thing I think to remember with uh, the use of the metadata in general is that a lot of these tools and systems and organizations that use it really are focused on pointing their own users to relevant content. So what's in the metadata is really useful for them. Site.ai is one example of a user. Uh, so they provide uh, citations for some context around the research to, to tell uh, users whether those citations support or contradict the research. And I think often it's hard to know kind of who's using the metadata and what they're using it for. So if you are interested in seeing some more use cases, we do have a, a blog series and you can take a look at, at some of the names um, that are using them and what they do with the metadata. So I mentioned that we have a number of APIs, but I think we are uh, mainly focused on search here today. So what you see here um, is from our main search page, search.crossref.org, and you can search all 135 million records. Um, you can also search for funders. So that's the example I've shared here that you see on the right. Uh, there is a, a database of global funders um, and it can be searched or downloaded. So here's another example from the search page. So my colleague is actually signed into her ORCID ID record um, at the Crossref page, looking for the ORCID ID. And the first few results here are already in her ORCID profile, but the one at the bottom isn't. So she can just click on that and add that to her ORCID profile. So that helps save her some time. And it also means that her ORCID profile is more fully populated, uh, that this information is available uh, in multiple places to facilitate discoverability. So I'll talk a little bit more about search, but while we're on the topic of ORCID, I also wanna mention our auto update feature. So authors, of course, uh, may have uh, ORCID IDs, they have a profile, again, you know, listing their publications on that, and they can submit that information when they submit a manuscript to a publisher and can include ORCIDs from their co-authors as well. So publishers get that information and submit it in the metadata to Crossref. We at Crossref see that there's a new record coming in, there are ORCID IDs in it, and we communicate that information to ORCID. So with the publisher, with the author's permission, excuse me, um, which we just asked for one time, every time we see that ORCID, we can ask ORCID to update the profile. So ORCID gets this information, they add the works to the author's profiles and then notify the authors of the change. And so if you've looked at uh, ORCID profiles before, you might not have noticed, but each item on it includes the source that the information came from. So in this example, it's Crossref. 
So I want to talk about reference linking uh, just briefly, but reference linking is one of the original sort of core functions that Crossref was set up for originally. Uh, this was in the early days of the web. Um, broken links became an obvious problem very early on. That's one of the reasons that uh, the DOI system was created uh, to maintain persistent links so they wouldn't be broken. And in the process of setting that up, um, it became clear that it made sense to have a reciprocal relationship among publishers so that in everybody's reference list, they would link out to other publisher content. So let me show you an example of that. So you can see it's just, it's much easier for researchers to see a list of references and click on a link to take them to that work, even if it's from another publisher. That way they don't have to copy and paste or go, or go searching for any of these references. And it also means that publishers are giving visibility to their own work, but also to other publishers as well. So uh, to touch on the research integrity use case, I wanna talk briefly about Crossmark, which is basically another set of metadata. And it tells readers if the content they're looking at is current and they use that button that you see at the top right. So um, it may be that the article, for example, that they're looking at is the correct version, or there may be another one. There may be, for example, corrections or retractions to that article. And that's fine and normal part of the scholarly record. And all this metadata can be maintained through Crossref and is included in those open APIs. So there's a couple of different kinds of information that can be included here, but just uh, so you have some examples here, uh, you see the button on the article. So uh, reader clicks on that and then they get a box like you see on the right that tells them if this document is current or there may be other um, versions or information to link to. So again, this is um, something that can be included in the metadata anytime, and there are a couple of different options for it. Um, and then I want to touch on the reporting and assessment use case for just a minute. Um, I like this example. This is the Initiative for Open Citations, or I4OC. There's also a companion effort um, called I4OA for abstracts. Um, because this is a nice example of using the entire metadata corpus to analyze, in this case, what percentage of references deposited with Crossref are open for everybody to use. And this number has actually improved since this uh, screenshot was taken. In fact, um, our board just approved a change so that going forward, starting in June, all references deposited with Crossref will be open. Um, but part of the reason I include this is not just because it's a good uh, use case for uh, the reporting and assessment uh, piece of using the metadata, but also because it's an, an initiative that publishers can sign up to to support if that's of interest. So I wanna talk a little bit about improving uh, metadata. And the first step in uh, improving metadata is just knowing what's in it and what's not. So a couple of years ago, we created participation reports. And this is just a nice, simple search. You can look up uh, yourself if you're a member or any other member and get kind of an, an overview of what's in the metadata. And again, what might not be. So you can see an example here. Uh, this is updated pretty regularly. So once you start uh, registering content with Crossref, you'll get this profile. You don't have to have a lot of content or be a member for very long to use it. Um, and it doesn't matter what you publish, there will be a participation report for it. So if this member published multiple journals, for example, you'd be able to search each journal title. You see that in the center there. On the left, I have journal articles circled. Um, this is a drop down. It could be books or book chapters or data sets or conferences or other content types. And we see in the center that uh, this publisher has 100% open references. That's great. Um, this isn't the full display. So there are a couple of other uh, metadata elements that are included here as well. So again, it's not all of the metadata. It's just a few key elements to give an indication of how complete the metadata might be or where improvements could be made. And so if you see on the left, this snapshot is looking at current content but um, it could be backfile, it could be all of the content. Uh, and I think if you look at these, some of these 
uh, you'll start to see that current content probably has more metadata in it than back file content, because of course, once metadata is deposited with Crossref, if it's going to be improved, then it would need to be added into existing records. But it can, again, that can be done at any time. Metadata can be redeposited at any time to make corrections or to add more information. There's no cost for that. So I wanna get back to search for a minute. Uh, because I mentioned reference linking and how links are included in references. And there's a couple of different ways to get those DOI links. One of them is through the search page. So I see I've got that circled at the top. So if you've got a reference list, you've got a bibliography uh, from an article or a book or whatever, you can just paste that in here and get back those DOI links to add in uh, for reference linking. The other things I want to point out here are under the blue actions button. So that first option to cite, uh, this is different than the site platform I shared earlier. Uh, this is a citation formatter. So you can pull up any record. Again, you can search all of the records um, and you'll get the site option. So if you want this citation in the APA format, for example, you can click and it will give you that. But mainly I want to point out the metadata as JSON function. So this appears on every single record, and it means that you don't have to go to our REST API if you're not comfortable using an API or you're not sure where to start. Um, so this will take you out to the REST API without having to use that interface. You can do the search here, and that API will tell you in JSON format everything that's in uh, the metadata for a particular record. And that's a good way to see um, what, what is included, how that particular output is described in the metadata. So I just wanna share one example. This is a PLOS One article, and this probably looks like a, a fairly familiar display. We see that this is an open access article. We can of course see the title of the article, we see all of the authors listed, we know that it has an abstract, we see that it has funding for this research. And so if we look at the metadata, and this is uh, um, an example of it from the REST API, again, not everything is included here, it can't all fit on the screen, um, but we see that um, it does include the funder information, it does include a license URL that will tell us that it's open access, it does include an abstract. And there's some other information in here, of course, as well, um, just to highlight references once again. At the top of the screen, you might see that it says reference count 33. That's something that Crossref provides. So we count up the, re the references for every record that comes to us and, and includes that in the metadata. So I think what's useful here, hopefully, is to consider what's in the content and whether that is fully described and correctly reflected in the metadata. So um, the, these principles from the Metadata 2020 effort might be of use to these kinds of conversations. I am a little bit biased. I was involved in some of this work myself. But if you're maybe trying to consider how to approach the metadata or what should be in it, um, there is a set of principles and an associated set of best practices with a little bit more detail that might help be help uh, guide those conversations. And if it's not helpful, that's certainly useful feedback for us to have as well. So all of this is really kind of uh, getting us toward what we call the research nexus. This is sort of our vision for how everything uh, can be described and connected. So I mentioned that, you know, sort of in the early days, it was really about that DOI link, uh, avoiding broken links, having that persistent link. Uh, and that certainly makes sense and is still very critically important. Over the past several years, we've been talking a lot more about the metadata associated with those DOIs. So again, getting each output really fully described and taking advantage of all of the uh, metadata fields that can be included. And now we're a little bit more focused in evolving this vision somewhat to uh, try to get all of these outputs connected up where they can be. And we know that there are a lot of connection points. We call them relationships. And again, it's a little bit more metadata that can be included that basically says, this record is connected to this other record in some particular way. So, for example, uh, you know, a lot of articles will have uh, funding behind the research. So uh, this article was funded by this research as an example of a relationship. 
Um, the research might have a data set associated with it. That's another relationship. And so we really want to get all of these connected up to make the, the metadata uh, better for those that use it and to really uh, make the scholarly record fuller and more complete. And not all of it comes from publishers. So uh, post-publication commentary, what we call event data, um, is something else that can be included here. And in fact, these relationships are becoming so important to us that we are looking at uh, setting up an API just to include that information. And so um, I, I do want to point out that, you know, the, the use of the metadata is increasing. I shared that uh, 600 million queries per month number earlier. Um, we were talking about this relationship metadata and use of the metadata is part of Crossref Crossref's overall strategic goals. So if you're interested to see our thinking behind all of this, it's of course uh, on our website. So that's it for me. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you and just share that there's uh, a lot more information here. There's a lot of metadata and a lot of information um, that can help uh, documentation. Um, it's, our support team is great. There's a community forum that um, you can use to ask questions. So I do uh, suggest that if you're looking for more information or unsure where to start or to go from here, that um, you can make use of some of this. Um, but I hope this talk today was useful and I thank you again for your time.